welcome to the reality revolution I'm your host Brian Scott one thing I really enjoy is getting into the many universal laws that truly affect the way we live our lives we have covered many of these laws in separate episodes the one law I have not dedicated an episode to is the law of compensation I put it simply this law represents the blessings and all the positive outcomes that we receive from our past activities or deeds it is the application of cause and effect relationships it also represents all of the terrible things that arrive from past activities we get reimbursed for our efforts it is very similar to the law of attraction according to the law of compensation we will only receive what is legitimately ours but if we have worked diligently and we're not rewarded we have not applied the law correctly the universal laws apply to both mathematics and science they consistently provide precise findings we must effectively utilize the law of compensation to better our lives this is because our present status depends on how we employ it if we fail to recognize this we will bear the repercussions and must recognize that our thoughts are how we can apply the universal laws as a spiritual law the law of compensation has a complexity and depth that can't be fully described here the law of compensation makes it obvious that nothing will change if we desire freedom but make no effort to change our circumstances there's so much to this we must collectively start to take stock of not only our thoughts but also our actions in the world we're provided three examples of attitudes and behaviors hindering our achievement do i anticipate receiving something for nothing do i attempt to avoid paying a bill or ask someone else to foot the bill am i stingy do i enjoy obtaining the greatest bargain regardless of the other party's ability to generate a profit do i receive what i pay for many people familiar with the law of attraction are not aware and do not consciously follow the fundamental laws of compensation the law of compensation ensures that individuals are fairly compensated for their work and contributions to society so in order for us to attract larger objects it is necessary to improve our capacity the law of compensation shows you how to accomplish this so in this episode I'm going to read from Raymond Hollowell and the Rosicrucian home and business principles that advise about the law of compensation even Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote an entire book on the law of compensation I was able to find so much amazing information regarding this law and the more I read it the more I realized that I needed to learn more and the best way for me to learn about the law of compensation other than through experience is to teach it and then in this teach learning we will discuss the way the law of compensation is explained to begin with h spencer lewis in his book rosicrucian principles for the home and business has a chapter on the law of compensation if you check out my previous episode ancient secrets for the attainment of wealth and the ancient secret to the law of assumption we have discussed rosicrucian principles rosicrucians collectively maintained an amazing library of literature and information from decades and centuries of the past and much of this information is incredibly helpful in receiving compensation and understanding the dynamics of wealth and prosperity Lewis, one of the main Rosicrucians, taught here about the law of compensation. Many people appeal to the cosmic or to the laws of psychology or mysticism for aid in their predicaments, yet they cannot show that at any time in the past have they cooperated with the cosmic in liberally helping others. The law of compensation clearly from Lewis's own account directly applies to service and underlying it our ability to provide service 
will only come back to us tenfold. Human beings attempted to reduce to material form the cosmic law of compensation, although they have made a miserable failure of it in most ways. Nevertheless, spiritually minded business people or mystical workers in the field of business have succeeded in establishing in their own lives and in their affairs some principles that are truly representative of the cosmic law of compensation. As I have said in the preceding chapters of this book, money as a means for rewarding and compensating people for their efforts is a false and arbitrary medium created by human beings without having the least relationship to the ideals of cosmic law. It is fortunate, however, that while we on one hand attempt to compensate those who work for us and those who contribute to our needs by paying them money, the cosmic law of compensation also operates to bring to each one of us a true compensation for what we have done, and in each element wherein our method of compensation fails to reward or punish adequately for each good or evil deed, cosmic law properly, efficiently, and sufficiently compensates and makes full adjustment. Individuals may scheme and plan to prevent the cosmic law of compensation from operating in their individual situations, and they may try to stop the great cosmic laws from adequately adjusting the compensation for their acts. They may even succeed for a time in escaping what they believe is imminent, but it is a fact that no one has ever successfully avoided, evaded, or escaped the operation of cosmic law completely and continuously. Men and women may cheat one another of their just rewards, and people and corporations may fail willfully or unconsciously to make proper compensation to those who work for them, but cosmic law never fails. It is immutable, of course, but it is also fair, just, and truly worthy of our admiration when once we understand the principles of cosmic compensation. Both employers and employees in major corporations and small businesses alike must all realize that injustice, unfair dealing, evil doing, and evil thinking will bring into operation the law of compensation as established in the cosmic, and that there is no escape from the operation of this law. The employer or employee who plans to take advantage of another human being, or of a group of human beings, including the citizens of a city, state, or nation, must expect the law of compensation to operate sooner or later and bring punishment to the mind and interests of the person who planned the injustice. Although it is often said that the law of compensation does not always bring an immediate manifestation of its operation, people do not necessarily always have to wait until the close of their lives to see the results of this cosmic law. There is no warrant for the belief that the law of compensation defers its reward until the close of life. I believe this common misunderstanding is due to the teachings of certain religious doctrines that refer to the ultimate rewards that all good people will receive in some future state, but so far as cosmic law is concerned, it makes compensation adequately and properly in such ways and at such times as will render the most help and benefit to the deserving one. For many business professionals with whom I have come in contact, their faith and trust in the operation of the law of compensation is solid and secure. I have met many business people who believe most implicitly that whenever they do a kindness or an unselfish act for someone else or contribute in any way to the health and happiness of others, they can expect some reward or some cosmic blessing, suddenly and uniquely, at almost the following hour. They have learned from experience that the cosmic brings its rewards not only suddenly but at a most propitious moment and that by helping others or contributing in whatever way they can to the needs and happiness of another they are accruing a certain amount of cosmic blessing or help that will come to them just when they need it and as they need it i do not mean to imply that such persons constantly have in mind a reward or return of their blessings whenever they do something for someone else. I've noticed from many reports and from many intimate contact with those who follow such principles in their lives that most of the unselfish or kindly acts performed by these persons are unplanned and wholly spontaneous 
and that it is only as they are performing the act immediately thereafter that they realize that in compensation for their rashness or liberality, there will be the proper return. It is only natural for someone to promptly question the logic of a spontaneous act or sudden urge, and to wonder whether it is worthwhile, diplomatic, or reasonable. It is at such moments of consideration of the spontaneous act that these persons generally conclude that even though it is sudden and probably urged by an emotional impulse, the cosmic is conscious of the urge and the wholehearted response to it and will compensate accordingly. Let me illustrate how such cooperation with cosmic law can really become a valuable asset in one's life. For a number of years, I was closely associated with and advisor to Mr. William Woodbury, who was a wealthy New Yorker given to the study of human needs. His business affairs, with which I was connected, were of such a nature as to permit him to have ample time for personal matters and provided him with an income sufficient to allow him to indulge in any of the costly hobbies and practices which often become the ruination of many wealthy individuals. Mr. Woodbury, however, decided that he would get more pleasure out of life if he could evolve some plans for helping the worthy and needy who wanted to help themselves. He had no faith in organized charity and did not believe that any form of charity helped the actual person who had a real need. Finally, a plan was evolved whereby Mr. Woodbury set aside $1 million in a bank in New York for the special purpose of helping others. He informed various business and charitable organizations that if they contacted any person who had a legitimate plan and was anxious to go into business for him or herself to send that person to see him. Mr. Woodbury opened a special office in a private residence in a secluded part of New York City, and there, each morning, we interviewed applicants for help. Briefly outlined, his plan was to find such persons who were competent in some definite line of business or trade, who had many years of experience in that particular line, and who were anxious to discontinue being employees and go into business for themselves. If such persons were well qualified in moral and ethical way, that is, not addicted to drinking, gambling, or other extravagant indulgences, and were healthy and responsible enough to start up their own business and build up a good clientele, he would loan them anywhere from 5000 to 25000 and in some cases even more. The money was loaned to such individuals without security and with no other pledge or promise than their personal word, and with no agreement as to the return of the money except that it should be returned from the legitimate profits of their businesses, and in such payments as they found were possible convenient, and not injurious to the progress of their business, and without any interest of any kind. Within a year, practically the whole $1 million had been loaned in this manner, and during the following year it was a pleasure to see that 98% of those who had secured the money were making various returns in accordance with the profits of their businesses, and in no way attempting to defraud Mr. Woodbury. After four years of operation of the plan, Mr. Woodbury found that quite a few had returned not only the original amounts that they had borrowed, but had donated to the fund liberal amounts to help others, and that on the basis on which it was working, his original $1 million would be returned with a very much larger increase than if he had loaned it at 6%. In fact, a report sent by Mr. Woodbury to me in 1924 showed that in 10 years previous, his $1 million had been returned and a large additional fund accumulated. He had proved his original contention that human nature could be trusted, and that the average person, if placed upon his or her word of honor, would not take advantage of any plan that was truly conceived to be non-commercial and 100% altruistic. Only a little over 2% of the persons he had tried to help had taken advantage of the situation and had either absconded or in other ways defrauded him, but he took no means to punish them or even search for them. The most important discovery made by Mr. Woodbury in connection with his humanitarian plan, however, was that soon after he inaugurated it, his other business affairs began to prosper far beyond his anticipation. Many persons who owed him large sums of money began to make payments 
and in other ways he found that the cosmic law of compensation was beginning to reward him for his efforts in behalf of others. He finally organized an institution of helpfulness for people in business, and up to the very last hour that it existed, before being completely abandoned in order to carry on other activities, it was one of the outstanding demonstrations of cosmic law. It is unfortunate that Mr. Woodbury is no longer around to carry on these forms of help, but there are undoubtedly others in this country and elsewhere who carry on the work originally begun by Mr. Woodbury. Another illustration is that of the work of Mr. Dodge, the New York financier and philanthropist with whom I was associated as an advisor and consultant for several years. Mr. Dodge was not only well known throughout the nation as a promoter of major corporations and big business, but he was one of the most generous workers I ever met in behalf of unfortunate people in New York City. From one end of the city to another, Mr. Dodge was known in the principal hotels, restaurants, clothing stores, and real estate offices when an unfortunate person appeared at a restaurant or a hotel and asked for a room or a meal and had a note written on the back of the card signed by Mr. Dodge. He or she was given every possible help and a note written by Mr. Dodge provided to many individuals a receipt for a month's rent for their apartment or home or some necessary furniture, groceries, or clothing. It was a pleasure to accompany Mr. Dodge to these merchants and listen to their reports and note the pleasure Mr. Dodge received in handing out his personal checks to pay for the things others needed and had received. What he had learned and what I knew of his business affairs proved the soundness of his activities. There never was one of his big business propositions that did not pay and proved to be an eminent success. Whether on Wall Street or in the financial corridors of Manhattan, the plans proposed by Mr. Dodge always came to fruition and he seemed to have what others called luck, and every person who had money for investment sought an opportunity to have an interest in any proposition that Mr. Dodge sanctioned or sponsored. He knew that he had cosmic cooperation and support because he believed himself to be one of the many silent and secret workers in behalf of the cosmic to help others. He used to take pleasure in telling others quite confidentially that he was incorporated and that his firm consisted of the cosmic hosts and himself with such a partnership no one could fail in business. Take the case of Sam Small, the president of the board of directors of one of the large serial companies of America. Mr. Small was at one time an abandoned waif and had to fight his way through life. But he never forgot in his days of wealth and prosperity the suffering of the orphans of the street. It was, indeed, a pleasure for anyone to accompany him in his automobile several nights before Christmas each year in whatever city he happened to be and watch him go into the byways of congested districts among the poor. He would take boys and girls to clothing stores where he would buy them the shoes, stockings, and overcoats that they needed, and then send them home with baskets of groceries or toys. Hundreds of children in many cities were helped in this manner each Christmas. He acted without ostentation and with no other motive than the sole pleasure he derived from helping others, and the idea that some divine law had raised him from poverty as a waif to great wealth for the purpose of enabling him to carry out the cosmic principles. He could not conceive of the possibility of his wealth having come to him for his own selfish use or the exclusive use of his immediate family, and he held fast to the true principle of being a steward of divine funds. And yet as quickly as Mr. Small expended his funds in this manner, his income was increased and increased until he became the head of many large companies. Mr. Small and many others would frankly tell you that at times, when they first felt the urge to give to others and to help others, they often had to seriously consider whether the few dollars they possessed should be rashly or spontaneously divided and given away or held in reserve for a possible rainy day. Many times that money in hand represented just a safe margin for emergencies in their business affairs, and in some cases, the plan for helpfulness 
called for the expenditure of every available dollar and the jeopardizing of personal interests at the time. That there was always the conviction, based upon previous experience, that if even the last penny is given away freely and without reluctance, and with that spontaneity of goodwill that the cosmic always uses, there would come a proper reward in the form of some adjustment of financial affairs that would remove any possibility of disastrous results to the giver. And so my plea to you must be that regardless of your station in life or the situation of your business and financial affairs, you must not permit your own needs and especially your contemplated needs to interfere with the liberality of your charity or the broadness of your helpfulness. It is a positive fact that as you act spontaneously and freely and without hesitation or long deliberation in the giving to someone else of that which you can give, but which you could use yourself so you will find the cosmic spontaneously and liberally coming to your aid at the proper time and with the same lack of hesitancy which you manifested. It is safe to say that the average person of health and business capabilities who finds herself or himself out of employment, out of funds, and out of contact with any who can help or tide over the serious situation, is a person who has failed in the past to give liberally and spontaneously when the cosmic urge came from within. Too many people appeal to the cosmic or to the laws of psychology and mysticism for aid in their predicaments, yet they cannot show that at any time in the past have they cooperated with the cosmic in liberally helping others merely to give advice to others who seek it, or simply to give a meal to one who begs at the door, or to drop a few coins in the Salvation Army pot, or to donate some old clothing to the orphanage, is not carrying out the greater work of the cosmic. Those who suddenly feel that there is something they can do for someone, something they can give, even though it hurts in a financial or material way, or something that they can do even though it is inconvenient, unpleasant, tiresome, and costly, and without hesitation, without reluctance, wholeheartedly submit to the urge, are those who truly are cooperating with the cosmic. They will find eventually, not in the days of the last judgment in the world beyond, but in the days here and now, that every crisis and in every need, the cosmic comes to their aid abundantly. It behooves everyone, therefore, who has read through this book with the hope of finding in it some help in solving personal problems to ask themselves this question, what have I done for others? And perhaps this additional question, what have I contributed to the cosmic supply that I may now appeal to the cosmic and withdraw from the positive supply? If you can find no positive, affirmative answer to your questions, and you believe even half reluctantly that you have been deficient in your cooperation with the cosmic in this regard. It will be well for you to consider immediately how you may proceed at once to help some others while you are seeking help for yourself. Before you expect any return through cosmic or mystic laws, be sure that you have done your utmost to help someone else, not only because of the reward that will come to you, but because it is your duty as it is the duty of every human being to be an earthly instrument in carrying out the cosmic scheme of things. And as long as you are out of attunement with the cosmic plans and not a part of the army of cosmic workers, you cannot expect the cosmic laws to help you and be unmindful of your neglect. Perhaps your very situation today, in whole or in part, and perhaps the problems which you now face and from which you have sought relief or now seek relief is a result of your failure to cooperate with the law of compensation in the past and therefore your present predicament is part of your karma. If this is so and no one else but you can know that it is then certain that you must first adjust your relationship with cosmic law and then with the cosmic hosts and finally with your fellow beings. The next portion I wanted to read was from a book called Working with the Law by Raymond Hollowell, who was a student and master of the laws of living, wrote this amazing book that details the different laws and how to work with them. This has one of my favorite chapters on the law of compensation. 
Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Galatians 6, 7. The world owes me a living, you hear people say often, with a reckless attitude of determination that they will collect that living in the easiest way they know how. It is current talk at the fireside, across the table, over the radio, and even a political issue that so-and-so should receive a pension in order that he might live on a sum of $200 per month or more or less. Therefore, the statement is familiar to most of us when we hear it. I don't deserve this, or how unjustly life has dealt with me, are common expressions of defeat and failure. Why should that person have more than I? I am just as good as he is. We hear these remarks again and again. The early religious teachings were that justice might be expected in another life. The rich and the powerful assumed to be the wicked and the overbearing were bound to receive their punishment in the end, while the poor and fortunate ones, the wretched ones, were to be devoted to their religion and their church, then they were sure to be bountifully rewarded in the next life. The promise of heaven and all that glitters has ever been held over them as a hope of future attainment to make up for their shortcomings on this plane of life. But no such attitude is ever accepted from the viewpoint of truth when you know the law. Sooner or later, we must come face to face with this law of compensation. And inevitably, our own comes to us and only what is our own. As we apply it to life and watch its certain results, do we find a balance for the effort of living? Are we satisfied with the good we are receiving? Are we getting fair returns for our efforts? Do we feel that our own has really come to us? Most people are dissatisfied. There are some who even go so far as to say that life is not worth living. The great majority declare that injustice is riotous in the world and more especially in our own lives, that unhappiness, sickness, and poverty exist through our living. In the study of the laws of truth, we learn to apply them so that they will dissolve all our adverse thoughts and conditions. The mistakes of a schoolboy do not come through the wise operation of the law. They come through miscalculation. These mistakes will continue so long as he continues using the law without correction. These mistakes will continue until he changes his way of using the law. He cannot change the law to suit his mistakes, but he must change his use of the law to correct application. The laws of successful living are the same as the laws of science. The supply and the possibility is ever the same and at hand, but it is our problem to change the use or application of the law in order to bring about conditions better than those we have had. The purpose of this lesson is to show you that you can use the law to lift yourself out of the place where you are to the place you rightfully belong. Your right place is where you can enjoy success and plenty. This is natural as the law intended. Your failure to realize these things is a miscalculation, a mistake. The law does not need to change. Success or prosperity does not need to be made. It always is. But you in turn must change. Then your affairs will follow the change. Where do you change? Well, the seat of all movement, the controller of all activity, is your thought. The key to every man is his thought, says Emerson. Why do prisoners strive to get the warden's keys, that they may gain their freedom in the outer world, because there is no other way out? Neither can you be free of your bonds except through the key, through the right use of your thought. The key to successful living is the right adjustment of your thoughts. If your thoughts are so constructive and proper, you cannot remain imprisoned. If you are dissatisfied and unhappy, you will be inspired for something better. If you want prosperity and success, but do not strive to change in any way, how can you expect things to be any different? A drunkard never becomes reformed until he decides to stop drinking. If some habit possesses or obsesses you, you are not the master of your life until you decide to change the habit. If you have been brought into the world amidst lack and limitation, you can never get above it until you change your ideas about it. There are many, many people who live and die and never know anything different from what has been handed down to them. Once you have changed your vision, you will change conditions. 
Only when we cease to recognize a condition do we cease to attract it. The only way we can cease to recognize things is to change our minds about them. Have you visited several homes and found them all different in some respect? They were neat, tidy, clean, orderly, bright, cheery, or dull, gloomy, disorderly, dusty, uninviting. The home is a reflection of the ruling mind. Its appearance speaks to its keeper's mind. If you are working for success, look at the home. If order is the first law, then it must also be your first application. No lack of money is no excuse for a disorderly home. It can be neat and clean even if you are using store boxes for furniture. If you wish a better home, a finer environment, nicer furnishing, you must alter your mind right where you are to receive better things. It is the little things that count and many little things make a big thing. It is useless to pray for a new home if you cannot take care of your present one. A couple operated a fish store in our neighborhood. They neglected to keep the store tidy, were not always courteous in their dealings nor prompt with deliveries. Becoming discouraged from repeated losses, they closed out, selling what equity remained. The couple who bought the failing business and the fixtures moved in, rolled up their sleeves, scrubbed the room, cleaned and dressed it up with tile boards, making it appear attractive and prosperous. They attracted business at once, established a name for quality food, cleanliness, and courtesy. Their business, in spite of former conditions, steadily grew until it was necessary to lease an adjacent room and increase the size of the store. Some years have passed, and these two people have enjoyed an enviable success in the same business and location where others had failed. The law helps those who help themselves. The law of compensation always works that way. When you perform your tasks, to the very best of your ability, or when you are thorough in your work and do it well, you infallibly bring out the best there is in you. Otherwise expressed, you grow more capable and efficient. You become better and thereby show your growing superiority. And the law is that he who becomes better will attract the better and be given the greater things to do. The principle involved is that when you become too large for your present place, you will begin to draw yourself to something larger. You cannot attract the better until you first become larger. You must earn what you receive or you cannot keep it. If an individual appears to do so, it will not continue, for in accordance with the law of compensation, that person will find his true place. Or as popularly expressed, like water, he will find his true level. Or you can't keep a good man down, in truth, the only bar to your advancement is your own unfitness. In other words, he who more than fills his present place will sooner or later be advanced. Were it not for this principle, there could be no progress, no growth, no development, no evolution. If the office is all cluttered up with papers, magazines, and bundles, if the boss's desk is stacked with mail and some a week old, the office force is careless. The business reflects the mind of the organization. The organization reflects the mind of its chief. Where do we go to find the cause of any leaks? We go to the head. We change his ideas and the whole organization is converted directly. Change the mind of the general and you have changed the route and purpose of the whole army. To blame your difficulty on outer conditions or on other people is not correct. It is not the law. It is you who are wrong. You have a snag in your mentality somewhere. Check back and readjust your ideas. They are creating and bringing forth your conditions. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Jesus included this law as a supreme factor in his doctrine. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Judge not, that ye be not judged. With what measure ye meet it shall be measured unto you. And Paul said, Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The law that we reap, that we sow, is mathematically accurate. Each experience through which we pass operates ultimately for our good. If we attract the unpleasant, it is often because some dormant or neglected phase of our nature needs to be awakened and developed. Also, we learn from the experience to create something better. Hence the degree of contentment and satisfaction attained in whatever sphere of life we may dwell is largely dependent upon our ability to use constructively the experiences of life. For in every case, the law of attraction will only bring what may serve us in our upward development. 
To interpret this law in a simple form, it should be stated that whatever we attract we require, and whatever we need is always good. This is a correct attitude to adopt because all experience is for our good and we must be able to see it in that light. While pursuing this practice, you may not always secure the precise form of results desired, but you will steadily build up your mind and character in harmony, beauty, and strength. Because all such effort to realize the ideal is highly constructive and develops in you the very qualities and conditions repeatedly pictured in mind. Clear, strong, positive thought along ideal lines is a wonderful preventive of morbid mental states and negative thinking, which leads to misdirected actions and conditions of weaknesses, misfortune, discord, and trouble. By constantly trying to meet and to deal with everything on its better side and to use the good it may contain to promote improvements, you are giving the whole attention to the ideal and cooperating with the law's fundamental purpose. Crowd out all inferior thoughts by superior thoughts, evil thoughts by good thoughts, ugly thoughts by beautiful thoughts, distressing thoughts by pleasant thoughts, and you will begin to overcome the growth of all negativity and confused states of wrong and discord. In other words, learn to think constructively of all persons, all things, all events, and all circumstances. Appraise them from the ideal point of view. As you do this, you will gradually transform your whole existence for the better. These are the means whereby you may steadily promote your welfare and advancement. As you train yourself to mentally look for the good, you will move towards the good, and as you form higher and larger conceptions of the good, these elements will begin to find expression in your words, acts, character, person, talents, powers, attainments, and achievements. That is, all things in your life will commence to improve as the direct result of your improved thinking. This process does not imply, however, that you are to ignore the wrongs of life, the empty places, and the undeveloped states of being, but that you are to think right through and beyond them towards the hidden good or the principle within that is ever seeking a higher and fuller expression. You will therefore cease to condemn and to criticize in a destructive manner. Instead, you will seek to bring out the good in yourself and in others and to discover and develop the greater possibilities everywhere. Whatever we possess today is our just reward. Very often it does not make us happy. We are dissatisfied with it, but still it remains ours. This fact would prove hopelessly discouraging were it not for a great truth that teaches us how to be free from every difficulty, released from all bonds, absolved from every debt. If you want success in living life, you must exercise an intelligent discrimination of your thoughts. When you talk hard times, money, scarcity, limitation, you are sowing that type of seed. What kind of harvest do you expect to get? If the farmer sowed thistle seed and then complained that his field did not bring forth wheat, you would say, foolish man, didn't he know he could only expect what he had planted? Never make an assertion, no matter how real it seems to be to you, if you do not want it reproduced or continued in your life. Do not say money is scarce. The very statement will send money away from you. Do not say times are hard. This will tighten your purse strings so tight that even God will not be able to slip in another coin. Do not say that you are not loved or not interested in other people's lives. Truly, you will lose their interest and their love. The spiritual supply from which the visible comes is never depleted. It never runs out. It is with you all the time. It will yield according to your demand upon it. It is not affected by your ignorant or blind talk or lack or loss. Only you are the one affected and you control your demonstration with your thought. The unfailing resource is willing to give. It has no choice in the matter. If you continue to pour out your thoughts into this substance, this will prosper you. Turn the energy of your mind upon ideas of plenty, love, happiness, joy, health, and they in turn will appear. If you want a better home, make the one you have as nice as you can. 
If you want new furnishings, new clothing, don't condemn or belittle what you have, but enjoy them to the fullest. If you want a position or a new one, get yourself in readiness to fill that position or improve the one where you are. Hence, your failure to meet your demands of life is not a failure of the material. It is but a failure within yourself of the lack of understanding or the lack of application. No matter what your problem is, the law can work it out. But you must adjust your thinking to work with the law. Do not expect that in just a few moments or a few applications you will realize a full consciousness of plenty. A builder does not erect a beautiful spire or dome to a million dollar cathedral without foundation. He must have support to hold that spire aloft. He builds walls and cross braces to hold each wall and each wall is built slowly and perfectly stone by stone. You must realize that by working and proving the law, you do so step by step, with each step bringing you closer to your goal. In Philadelphia, a man boasted that he was a success. He rose above his competitors, he drove them off the street, some of them out of business. He founded his business upon competition, but I learned only recently that his business had dwindled down to the place where he was forced to close out and move to a smaller town. The law of compensation works slowly, but surely one cannot build upon the substance or the virtue that another has created. You can only build on that which you create. Competition in business is a rivalry or strife for two or more people. Fearing there is not enough for all, they fight with one another to get all they can. Don't fear your neighbor is getting more out of life than you are. Don't try to compete with anyone or anything. It has been said that competition is the spirit of business. But I do not think that competition in the form of rivalry and strife, of arguing and fighting and lying about each other and each other's business is the right spirit. I know it is not. Rather than call competition the spirit of business, let us call its compensation. Compensation means equal returns for that which is given. It means a balance of that quality or service that is extended to another. I am certain that if you conduct your life, which is your business, along the path of compensation rather than competition, you will find it more enjoyable to compare your quality and service with another. The better your service, the greater the reward the more business you will attract. If you follow this law, you will find that it is the golden rule in any life or in any business. You will be certain to succeed, no matter if there are other so-called competitors seeking business in the same block. If you're not succeeding, if you lack any good thing, look more closely to the cause. It is not outside, it is somewhere within. See where you fail to use the law correctly or where you fail in your consciousness to think rightly. There are three points common in everyday life where one may fall into a snare and a delusion. First of all, do you expect something for nothing? Does it make you feel good, pleased, when you get something without paying for it? If so, you're violating the law. Your returns will always be unsatisfactory no matter where you go. Be willing to pay your way. Have you known people who hang back when you go out for an evening's entertainment? They stand back and let the other fellow pay for the show. People like that lose hundreds of dollars when they try to save themselves a paltry 50 cents. The quality of thought they entertain repels many dollars they rightly could attract. If you knowingly cheat another one of a dollar, it may cost many dollars for the mistake. Second, do you hunt for things that are called cheap? Are you a bargain hunter? Cheap thoughts can only bring cheap returns. You who wait for bargain days will always have to take bargains. But remember, there are no bargains in life. If you have gained monetarily, you may have lost in other ways. You place yourself in a vibration that lowers your present state. It forces you below your proper level. It limits your thought to a state where you support underselling, cutting, bankruptcy, and dishonesty on the part of the seller. You must lie or deceive or cheat somehow about the price of the bargain or some other article because he is in business to make a fair profit. Thus, you become a party to the violation and come under its penalty. Third, do you begrudge spending money? Do you hate to pay your bills? Release your money cheerfully even if it be the last dollar you have. Decide what your need is. If it is of more value than the dollar in your purse, then spend the dollar cheerfully. In this way, 
you comply with the law. Often, when we get to a low level, we begin to tighten up on our purse strings. We begin to hold back. This is like closing the faucet, limiting the supply from pouring into you. I remember a man telling of a time he had an urgent need for $1,000. He had but a $10 bill in his purse, and he was holding on to that bill like a drowning man to a straw. For days, he said, he carried it about with him, afraid to spend it for fear of being broke. Suddenly it occurred to him that he was pinning his faith more on the $10 than he was on the true source of supply. He was closing his faucet with a mere $10 bill. It had grown to become fearful obstruction. When he realized this truth, he sat down at once and mailed the bill to a nearby church, and following the release of the bill, supply began to flow to him. Before that week was out, he received his thousand dollars enough to pay the month's obligations. He added, Never since has supply failed to flow to me, for I learned my lesson. The law inevitably produces its own exactness as a rule of action. It is a divine law and tolerates no violation. It does not bring forth figs from thistles if man misuses the law of harmony, health, or supply, the law of compensation becomes manifest. We are free agents to choose the method of procedure in our life. The law is infinite, and through its expression all things are possible to us. Every time we choose a good thought, we make a good investment. What is life giving you today? Health, happiness, and abundance, or sickness, misery, and lack? Whatever it is, it is your own. It belongs to no one else but you. You make your own investments and you are daily enjoying the profits or losses. If you are dissatisfied with your investment, it may be wise for you to note what you invested. Only your own can come to you and be sure that all that is yours will become manifest. It is your responsibility. No other person may share it. Your own and all your own will come to you. I rave no more against time or fate, for lo, my own shall come to me. John Burroughs. The final work I wanted to read from was Compensation by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Emerson, who surprisingly I haven't covered on the podcast, was an American essayist, a lecturer, a philosopher, an abolitionist, a poet who led the transcendentalist movement of the mid 19th century. And he was a champion of individualism and a critic of countervailing pressures of society. Nisha considered him one of the most gifted Americans, and Walt Whitman referred to him as his master. In his book, Compensation, Emerson claims, I shall attempt in this in the following to record some facts that indicate the path of the law of compensation. Happy beyond my expectation if I shall truly draw the smallest arc of this circle. Polarity, or action and reaction, we meet in every part of nature, in darkness and light in heat and cold, in the ebb and flow of waters, in male and female, in the inspiration and expiration of plants and animals, in the equation of quantity and quality, in the fluids of the animal body, in the systole and the diastole of the heart, in the undulations of fluids and of sound, in the centrifugal and centripetal gravity, in electricity, galvanism, and chemical affinity, Superinduced magnetism at one end of a needle, the opposite magnetism takes place at the other end. If the south attracts, the north repels. To empty here, you must condense there. An inevitable dualism bisects nature so that each thing is a half and suggests another thing to make it whole, as spirit, matter, man, woman, odd, even subjective, objective in, out, upper, under motion, rest, yea, nay. Whilst the world is thus dual, so is every one of its parts. The entire system of things gets represented in every particle. There is somewhat that resembles the ebb and flow of the sea, day and night, man and woman, in a single needle of the pine, in a kernel of corn, in each individual of every animal tribe, the reaction so grand in the elements is repeated within these small boundaries. For example, in the animal kingdom, the physiologist has observed that no creatures are favorites, but a certain compensation balances every gift and every defect. A surplusage given to one part is paid out 
of a reduction from another part of the same creature. If the head and neck are enlarged, the trunk and extremities are cut short. The theory of the mechanic forces is another example. What we gain in power is lost in time, and the converse, the periodic or compensating errors of the planets, is another instance. The influences of climate and soil in political history are another. The cold climate invigorates, the barren soil does not breed fevers, crocodiles, tigers, or scorpions. The same dualism underlies the nature and condition of man. Every excess causes a defect, every defect an excess. Every sweet hath its sour, every evil its good. Every faculty which is a receiver of pleasure has an equal penalty put on its abuse. It is to answer for its moderation with its life. For every gain of wit, there is a grain of folly. For everything you have missed, you have gained something else. And for everything you gain, you lose something. If riches increase, they are increased that use them. If the gatherer gathers too much, nature takes out the man who she puts into his chest, swells the estate, but kills the owner. Nature hates monopolies and exceptions. The waves of the sea do not more speedily seek a level from their loftiest tossing than the varieties of condition tend to equalize themselves. There's always some leveling circumstance that puts down the overbearing, the strong, the rich, the fortunate, substantially on the same ground with all others. Is a man too strong and fierce for society and by temper and position a bad citizen, a morose ruffian with a dash of pirate in him? Nature sends him a troop of pretty sons and daughters who are getting along in the dame's classes at the village school and love and fear for them smooths his grim scowl to courtesy. Thus she contrives to intenerate the granite and felspar, takes the boar out and puts the lamb in and keeps her balance true. The farmer imagines power and place are fine things, but the president has paid dear for his white house. It has commonly cost him all his peace and the best of his manly attributes. To preserve for a short time so conspicuous an appearance before the world, he is content to eat dust before the real masters who stand erect behind the throne. Or do men desire the most substantial and permanent grandeur of genius? Neither has this an immunity. He who by force of will or of thought is great and overlooks thousands has the charges of that eminence. With every influx of light comes new danger. Has he light? He must bear witness to the light and always outrun that sympathy which gives him such keen satisfaction by his fidelity to new revelations of the incessant soul. He must hate father and mother, wife and child. Has he all that the world loves and admires and covets? He must cast behind him their admiration and afflict them by faithfulness to his truth and become a byword and a hissing. The law writes the laws of cities and nations. It is in vain to build or plot or combine against it. Things refuse to be mismanaged long. Though no checks to a new evil appear, the checks exist and will appear. If the government is cruel, the governor's life is not safe. If you tax too high, the revenue will yield nothing. If you make the criminal code sanguinary, juries will not convict. If the law is too mild, private vengeance comes in. If the government is a terrific democracy, the pressure is resisted by an overcharge of energy in the citizen, and life glows with a fiercer flame. The true life and satisfactions of man seem to elude the utmost rigors or felicities of condition and to establish themselves with great indifferency under all varieties of circumstances. Under all governments, the influence of character remains the same, in Turkey and in New England about all alike. Under the primeval despots of Egypt, history honestly confesses that man must have been as free as culture could make him. Every act rewards itself, or in other words, integrates itself in a twofold manner. First in the thing or in real nature, and secondly in the circumstance or in apparent nature. Men call the circumstance the retribution. The causal retribution is in the thing and is in seen by the soul. The retribution is in the circumstance by the understanding. It is inseparable from the thing, but is often spread over a long time and so does not become distinct until many years. The specific stripes may follow late after the offense, but they follow because they accompany it. 
Men seek to be great. They would have offices, wealth, power, and fame. They think that to be great is to possess one side of nature, the sweet, without the other side, the bitter. All things are double, one against another. Tit for tat, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, blood for blood, measure for measure, love for love. Give and it shall be given to you. He that watereth shall be watered himself. What will you have, quoth God, pay for it and take it? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Thou shalt be paid exactly for what thou hast done, no more and no less. Who doth not work shall not eat. Harm watch, harm catch. Curses always recoil on the head of him who imprecates them. If you put a chain around the neck of a slave, the other end fastens itself around your own. Bad counsel confounds the adviser. The devil is an ass. You cannot do wrong without suffering wrong. No man had ever a point of pride that was not injurious to him, said Burke. The exclusive in fashionable life does not see that he excludes himself from enjoyment in the attempt to appropriate it. The exclusionist in religion does not see that he shuts the door of heaven on himself in striving to shut out others. Treat men as pawns and nine pins and you shall suffer as well as they. If you leave out their heart, you shall lose your own. The senses would make things of all persons, of women, of children, of the poor, the vulgar proverb, I will get it from his purse or get it from his skin, is sound philosophy. All infractions of love and equity in our social relations are speedily punished. They are punished by fear. Whilst I stand in simple relation to my fellow man, I have no displeasure in meeting him. We meet as water meets water or as two currents of air mix with perfect diffusion and interpenetration of nature. But as soon as there is any departure from simplicity and attempt at halfness or good for me that is not good for him, my neighbor feels the wrong. He shrinks from me as far as I have shrunk from him. His eyes no longer seek mine. There is war between us. There is hate in him and fear in me. There is a deeper fact in the soul than compensation, to wit its own nature. The soul is not a compensation but a life. The soul is, under all this running sea of circumstance, whose waters ebb and flow with perfect balance, lies the aboriginal abyss of real being. Essence or God is not a relation or a part but the whole. Being is the vast affirmative, excluding negation, self-balanced and swallowing up all relations, parts and times within itself. Nature, truth, virtue are the influx from thence. Vice is the absence or departure of the same. Nothing, falsehood, may indeed stand as the great night or shade on which as a background the living universe paints itself forth, but no fact is begotten by it. It cannot work for it is not. It cannot work any good. It cannot work any harm. It is harm inasmuch as it is worse not to be than to be. We feel defrauded of the retribution due to evil acts because the criminal adheres to his vice and contumacy and does not come to a crisis or judgment anywhere in visible nature. There is no stunning confutation of his nonsense before men and angels. Has he therefore outwitted the law? Inasmuch as he carries the malignity and the lie with him, he so far decreases from nature. In some manner there will be a demonstration of the wrong to the understanding also. But should we not see it, this deadly deduction makes square the eternal account. In the nature of the soul, is the compensation for the inequalities of condition. The radical tragedy of nature seems to be the distinction of more and less. How can less not feel the pain? How not feel indignation or malevolence towards more? Look at those who have less faculty, and one feels sad and knows not well what to make of it. He almost shuns their eye. He fears they will upbraid God. What should they do? It seems a great injustice. But see the facts nearly and these mountainous inequalities vanish. Love reduces them as the sun melts the iceberg in the sea, the heart and soul of all men being one. This bitterness of his and mine ceases. His is mine, I am my brother and my brother is me. If I feel overshadowed and outdone my great neighbors, I can yet love, I can still receive. And he that loveth maketh his own the grandeur he loves. Thereby I make the discovery that my brother is my guardian, acting for me with the friendliest designs and the estate I so admired and envied is my own. 
It is the nature of the soul to appropriate all things. Jesus and Shakespeare are fragments of the soul and by love I conquer and incorporate them in my own conscious domain. His virtue is not that mine, his wit. If it cannot be made mine, it is not wit. So it was my opinion that these three writers really did a good job of capturing the complexities of the law of compensation. This law is perfect and works perfectly in your life. Here's an example. I used to work in the mortgage business and I started out desperate for a job and I found a job at a subprime lender where we gave incredibly high interest rates with adjustable rates that were just devastating to people. It might start out at a low rate and then within six months it would jump up like 9% and it was terrible. I made money on it and I was compensated well. I would call people in the phone book or find ways to find people that were desperate for a loan and I would give them terrible interest rates. I remember talking to a woman that was on her deathbed and selling this loan to someone and I had the money and it was great and later on in my life I lost my house. That foreclosure was absolutely the law of compensation working perfectly for the bad loans I had done in the past. Anytime I've cheated or done something wrong or incorrect in a job, it has always come back to me in some beautiful way reflected perfectly in my actions. I have continued to try to make up for debts that I didn't pay. I always ended up having to pay debts in some way, shape, or form. If I had not paid debts, they ended up coming back to me years later. All debts are paid. Everyone is properly compensated. And if you understand these laws, the cosmic, the universe, God is working perfectly in all things. And if you just understand it, you can use it to your advantage by being of service to others. And the service flows back to you in numerous and beautiful ways and experiences. Now in the first reading, they refer to the law of compensation as karma. Yet, at the same time, it could be different. Karma also sometimes seems to imply punishment that can come after your life in other lifetimes. But there is a law of cause and effect in this world. It is the way the program works. It is important for us to study these laws because they are a part of the simulation. We are working with coded laws that affect our consciousness, our behavior, and the actions of others. And so you will reap what you sow. It always works out that way. People are struggling with the law, ripped people off in the past. It always works out perfectly. There may be events and things that happen where you say, that person has never been properly punished. Believe me, the experiences that they're having in their life, they are being punished in some way, shape, or form. You have no idea. Everything is balanced perfectly. All of the universe is in balance. Everything in nature is in balance. The water always moves back to level every single time. And so you are compensated in balance. If you don't give enough and then you need money, you're going to have a hard time getting it. So just remember this law. It is active in all operations and it is a way to acquire and magnetically attract large things by understanding this aspect of the universe. The law of compensation will work perfectly for you. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com And welcome to The Reality Revolution. Thank mm-hmm. you.